Another insightful session at NestGen24. Today, we're navigating the intricate pathways of the US regulatory landscape. Now, this is going to be a session that promises to demystify the complex web of regulations governing the skies and digital frontiers of the United States. As we stand on the cusp of a new era in technology and innovation, understanding the regulatory environment is more crucial than ever. Whether you're a startup founder, a tech giant, or a curious mind eager to understand how policies shape our technological futures, you're in the right place. Our panel today is a diverse group of experts who live and breathe regulatory policies, right? They come from a wide variety of backgrounds, all united by a common goal, to make sense of the U.S. regulatory landscape for the betterment of technology, the industry, and society. So they're going to be sharing their insights into current regulations, anticipated changes, and strategies for navigating compliance in a rapidly evolving ecosystem. Expect a deep dive into challenges and opportunities that lie ahead with practical advice and visionary outlooks. Before we get started, a couple of housekeeping. If you have questions, uh, please feel free to uh, use them in the Q&A. Uh, so I would say go ahead and uh, do the uh, the Q&A section. Uh, this is proudly sponsored. Thank you to our sponsors, DJI Enterprise and Sunflower Labs for helping us bring this event to you. And last but not least, this is being recorded. So you want to hear this again? It, you absolutely can. It, just give them a few days and they're going to get the, after they get some sleep, they're going to go ahead and get this recording out to all the attendees. Now, Let's meet our panelists. So I invite each of you to introduce yourselves and share a brief glimpse into your journey through the regulatory world. Let's start with hmm, Jim Baker. Good afternoon, everybody. Well, at least afternoon where I'm at. Um, it's good, great to be here today. My name is Jim Baker. Um, my, uh, my past was uh, 30 years in law enforcement. Uh, the last 10 of which was uh, spent running a, a, a drone program for the Curry County Sheriff's Office. Um, and with the regulatory side of it, of course, you know, the, the, the lower level regulatory side, of course, we had the 107 with pilots and everything. Um, but towards the end of my career, we uh, stood up a, a DFR program with uh, Beyond Visual Line of Sight uh, waivers and, uh, um, you know, being able to run uh, the drones from remote locations. So that was my foray into the, uh, the FAA and the FAA safety committees and the uh, the maze and uh, complicated framework that that is. Thanks, Jim. Let's move on to John. Cool. Thanks, Jason. Uh, John Hegardis. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Aloft. Um, we found the company in 2015, and I'd say for most of that, have been uh, helping our users, our customers, our partners navigate regulations that started with 333 and, and 107, and, and now we have the the inklings of 108. Um, I've also been fortunate to serve on a couple of uh, uh, FAA ARCs, uh, including the BV Loss ARC that wrapped up last year and we should get rules uh, this summer about. So I'm happy to share kind of some of those learnings and, and insights from behind the scenes a little bit. John, thank you. Uh, let's move on to Reno. Hello, everyone. Uh, Reno Matthews. I work as Director, Regulatory Compliance and Safety at Volatis Aerospace. My background's been in engineering, aviation, SMS, data analytics, and project management. I've been uh, working the past eight years in the UAS industry, uh, primarily focusing around uh, regulatory compliance, engineering, uh, as well as SMS. And it's uh, glad to be here in this panel. Thanks, Reno. Really glad that you're here. And last but certainly not least, Akaki. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, yeah, Kagi Julia. I work now for uh, Metric Space, uh, leading their standards compliance and regulatory engagement work. Previous to this work, uh, been involved with the US industry for around eight years, doing a bunch of contracting work with FAA and NASA. And previous to the year of that, used to be an air traffic controller the tower and approach so yeah 
from uh, regular aviation to the drone uh, aviation. Awesome. Kaki, thank you so much. Panelists, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, I want to keep this fairly conversational. I want to, you know, we just have one set of questions that I would love to get everyone's perspectives on. Uh, John, you brought up the, the, obviously we're going to talk about it, right? We got to talk about it, the BV loss arc. So considering the FAA's Beyond Visual Line of Sight, Aviation Rule Taking, Com Rulemaking Committee, BV loss arc, considering those recommendations and the introduction of Part 108, how do you foresee these developments influencing the operational frameworks and the levels of autonomy for drone docks and BV loss operations? Follow on to that just to keep it rolling. What steps should stakeholders take to align with these regulatory changes while advancing the capabilities and safety of autonomous drone technology? Wow, that was a lot. Yeah, that, that was a lot. Um, I, I think... You know, looking at the the arc, I know a lot of the participants had some comments and feedback and some frustrations, but um, I think where the arc came out was ultimately pretty progressive and, and equitable, saying, hey, let's revisit a lot of these assumptions that we started with. So uh, I always like to point to operations over people where it's like, hey, let's measure how much force it takes to, if a drone hits your head to kill you. And I think in the arc, what we did was we said, okay, that's good to know, but what are the chances it's going to hit you in the head in the first place? Right. And I think started to measure kind of not just the ultimate, what if worst possible thing, but what's the severity of that? What's the likelihood of that? And I think where we got with, uh, with BB loss was saying, uh, you know, there's a good safety case here there's less risk and, and kind of less severity and probability on a lot of these situations. And um, I think the other thing that is almost kind of beyond the FAA a little bit, but I think the ARC spoke to, which was um, if we look at this holistically, BV loss transforms all of transportation, right? It's good for the environment. It's good for traffic. It's good for all of these other effects. Um, now we're in the, the rulemaking process, right? Everything is kind of behind closed doors. So we'll see what, what comes from it. Um, and I think uh, I think similar to we saw with the remote ID rule, um, the, I'm sure depending on which side you're on, right? If you're on the legacy small plane crop duster helicopter crowd, you may not be too happy. If you're on the drone side, you may not be too happy. So I think just as a drone community, we need to be ready to make sure we have our voices heard because we represent the, the largest uh, numbers of pilots and aircraft in the sky, and we have a great safety record. Let's uh, utilize this natural resource that we have. Uh, great answer, John. I really appreciate that. Um, let's move on. Uh, Akaki, thoughts? Yeah, I think uh, it's going to be really interesting with this Part 108 coming into the place. Uh, hopefully this year, this NPRM should be come out uh, in summer, late summer, uh, early fall. Um, I think uh, what would be really interesting, just overall, what you asked Jason about the autonomy levels, I think that could be one of the just challenging, not with this rule, but maybe overcoming years, because I think we have to uh, somehow figure out that not all the players will be on the same level of autonomy when, you know, this autonomy levels will come gradually. Some will be very much advanced and then some people will still be hand flying part 107, right? So all these people have a right to be in the airspace. So how do we integrate this like way way higher levels of autonomy with just you know hand flying guys like recreational so i see that one of the like challenges coming up in these years and then it, it is uh, honestly uh, even a bigger challenge probably in, like legacy aviation because uh fortunately or unfortunately uh actual airplanes uh fly for really really long times so some of the some of the airframes i, I don't know if you fly in us it's like something on like 25, 30 years, right? So just to retrofit all of those, it's, it takes, it's it's like, just look at the ADS-B equipment, right? Like still some of the big airlines are not equipped. So uh, one good thing with the drone industry is like uh, drones are, you know, 
still pretty cheap and then still you know like people are still you know not flying them for like 15 years or something like like it uh, they renew it like really fast so i would say yes maybe this like technology will be easier to like replace and go to the like higher autonomy and like newer technology uh, vehicles but yeah i think this autonomy levels how to match them and then how eventually to manage them uh, that would be really interesting and uh, maybe one of the challenges thanks akaki uh, jim thoughts well, I think our, our mindset has to be going forward to this is, is just be fluid and flexible. Um, there's one thing that is, is for sure, technology is going to outpace regulation. And so we have to look at the regulation, kind of guide our technology to work within the regulation and, and be flexible to do as much as they'll let us and keep working with them to, to give us more. So the autonomy is, is, is the key. The autonomy is, is is probably the easier part of this. The regulation is what's going to going to hold us back a little bit, um, and I think it's going to take some regulation, some flexibility on both sides. So right now, it seems the drone industry is is flexing the most and trying to figure this out, where manned aviation isn't doing as much because they're already ingrained. Um, you know, one simple thing that will help the autonomy is if they mandated ADSB on all airplanes in all airspace. You know, right now we've got a lot of airspace that ADSB is not required, so now we're in a situation where we have to mitigate those non-compliant or, or non-participating, not compliant, non-participating aircraft um, to make sure that everything stays safe. Well, they're, because of, of the gravity of where drones is going, I think we need to, to have a little bit of flexibility on both sides. I think it would help the industry greatly. Getting that to change, you know, I'm not from the manned aviation industry, but the, the people I know, that that's probably a, a bigger lift than getting the drone world to comply. Um, so, but, but we need to, to, to work, do our best to work with the regulatory authorities uh, for the, with the automation, make sure they understand what we're capable of, the safety levels in that automation, and uh, see if we can, can try to get some flexibility on both sides. Yeah, F flexibility is the key to air power. Uh, some general said that sometime. Um, Reno, thoughts on this question? No, I think, um anything from the regulator, any progress towards uh, opening up BB laws operations uh, for the industry is it's, it's taken as a positive approach. And I think uh, uh, it's, it's exciting to see uh, those changes come into effect. And when we see part 108 come out, uh, as we all know, 107 has its limitations today with the extensive work that it's required uh, to fly BB laws based on waiver application. And at least Anything that's open, I think uh, it's something that we can be flexible towards. I do uh, appreciate the risk-based approach that they're also looking towards. And um, I, I think uh, this is uh, definitely, uh, if, if anything, it's something positive to look forward to uh, as operators. Absolutely. Um, okay, definition time. So in the arc, you could see that they 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 talk about shielded BB loss operations. So how and we're going to go back around um how do shielded bb loss operations redefine the boundaries of drone logistics now especially with drone docks what potential do they hold for expanding operational capabilities beyond the current limitations let's see let's go with jim well certainly with the the uh, shielded operations it, it brings in a an I want to say an easy level of, of safety uh, because of the shielded environments, there's less concern. We were talking about a second ago with the, with manned aviation. There's definitely a, a lot less concern of the, the manned aviation being in that area, people being in that area. So as long as they can define the shield and extend those those definition of shields, um, we're certainly expanding, you know, in the, in the beyond visual line of sight uh, world tremendously, um, you know, and, and it, being able to expand the, the areas we can fly that brings in more of the autonomy to cover more ground, you know, more efficiency, um, you know, everything we're looking for comes with that expansion of the, the shielded. Obviously we want to go beyond just a shielded environment, uh, but I think that first step is shielded. And one of the, the difficulties of course, is defining shielded. Um, you'll ask 10 people and get 10 vastly different answers, which what shielded is. And, and there's probably the other, other nine people that, that I'm, of, of, the, of the first 10, I probably have a different idea than what I just said. Um, so, uh, as soon as we can really nail down what that shield is, um, the regulatory side can really define what is that safe distance being in and around those shielded environments uh, to where we can really go forward. And that's where the autonomy is going to expand. 
And that's, that's the important part because the more area we have to expand the autonomy, the more autonomy we have, the more efficiency, the, the better end result for our customers, whatever that utility customer is or, or that, that, that asset inspection customer is, um, benefits from us being able to increase that efficiency through, through a shield environment. Thanks, Jim. Uh, John, can you expand on that thought? Yeah, I've actually been, um, I'd say, pretty optimistic about shielding kind of from where it came from in the arc, which was, you know, very, you know, belt and suspender saying, all right, if my drone's nearby the power line, there probably aren't uh, aircraft flying around near the power line, right? Um, and so that, that was kind of that first um, thing to say, all right, if I'm near a building, right, drones are going to be very close to what they're doing a lot of times. Uh, or even if they're flying long distance, they can use that um, kind of shielding mechanism. Um, but I would say lately I've seen a lot of BV loss waivers where it's a much more progressive kind of shielding than, um, than I, I think um, I was expecting, at least just speaking from kind of what I was anticipating where um, – uh, I've seen BV loss waivers for, for dock operations where um, you look and say, hey, what's the tallest structure in this X mile area? Stay below that. Like then we can really not just think about point to point or very specific routes, but we actually have a wide area over which we can fly. So um, hopefully we, we get that same level um, in the rule that we've seen in, in waivers. So if that's if that's a clue, then I think we'll be in good shape. So it's not just. <laughs> I make a joke about this. I, I'm being serious when I do that. My when I do my pre flights, obviously they're a very important part of any drone operation. Um, I almost always throw in there something related to if I'm operating at 200 feet doing a facade inspection or something like that. I usually tell my visual observer, look, if there's something operating at our operational altitude, my drone's not going to be the problem. Like, <laughs> exactly. It's be real, right? Exactly. So, I mean, like if, if if it's where I am, it's crashing. Like, yeah. sorry, like even yeah, a like, hot air balloon or helicopter, right? It's not going to be that close to a building, right? If you're doing a sun inspection, yeah, no, exactly. no, yeah. So it's just I don't know. It's interesting. Um, let's move on to uh, uh, Reno. Thoughts on this particular shielding? So the fact that the regulator has already done that data, that research, and defined the definition of shielded operations. And they've already proven that, you know, if you are within that proximity to infrastructure, very low altitude, uh, you know, and uh, uh, you can fly a rule-based approach to fly within that shielded operation. So as an operator, at least that takes off the burden from us from proving any uh, safety data uh, to prove that this airspace is safe or it's low traffic density and the collision, the chances of collision with manned aircraft is low. I think that's taken off. And now that they've given that defined uh, definition or approach as an operator, we just have to prove now our con ops that it fits or our flight plan fits within that volume of shielded operations. And as long as I fit that, uh, you know, I go BB loss or I fly BB loss provided I meet all the criteria that's set for shielded operations. So that definitely opens much more doors, reduces the complexity uh, of uh, you know, any uh, traditional BV loss operations that you would see uh, or having any complex technology such as detect and avoid technology. And uh, this definitely, I think as yes, we can all see open doors for uh, power line and utility inspection primarily. Uh, thanks, Reno. Kaki, do you think this definition uh, appeases the traditional aviation community? Um, yeah, I, I, I have kind of like controversial thoughts about this <laughs> in general. Uh, well, I, I think, uh, honestly, the U S regulation, it's not even a regulation. It's like, they just started issuing with the uh, waivers with the shielded. Right. So, but, you know, we should, we should remember that, uh, you know, Jaros Sora, you know, arc a, that's basically a shielded operation, you know, like within 50 feet of obstacle or, uh, building. Right. So. Uh, whoever adopted Jarosora uh, methodology, they were been already doing this, you know, throughout the world, and I think in Canada also. But um, what I'm always a little bit skeptical is that 
uh, especially if, when we don't really have actual you know distance from the obstacle or uh, defined it might like some people define 50 feet some people define 200 feet you know and then everyone has its own right to define kind of themselves but you know there they might be a cases of gaming the system when you know some people say that hey um a railroad is an infrastructure it's uh, and then if I'm above a railroad, like 200 feet, I'm in this like shielded airspace, which uh, maybe technically, yes, but you know, like really like above railroad 200 feet, you know, so I think it will be kind of like a lot of back and forth in the coming months and year, but I think we'll settle down on more or less some kind of like uh some range and some maybe use cases you know for infrastructure inspection it will be these for some of that but i think overall it, it's really good because you know like in uh, in us people were asked to you know like have a da solution or a vo for basically any uh bv loss operations right but like there will be some use cases who will just use uh a shielded operation and then they never have to worry about the vo or da so it's good enough for them right like it could be fully autonomous so there but it also has a stretch right like and i think in this coming years we'll settle down i'm pretty sure you know and then uh, we'll get some better definitions and more granular i i do like a little I, perspectives are, are important right that that's that's what we're, we're trying to bring here on this, this panel uh, so thank you for that. Um, so you also brought up, and this is not a lone topic. There's been other panels that have talked specifically about the role of human oversight in like visual observers. So like, obviously in this landscape, what is the evolving role of human oversight? How does it interplay to enhance safety and operational integrity? Um, let's go back to, let's go, let's go back to Jim. Let's start with here. Well, I've got a, a little bit of experience seeing those differences um, from my past life in our in our Jones's first responder program. We had a, a BV loss uh, a waiver, and you know they they told us that as long as you can see two miles beyond your operational area, um, you're good to go, no problem. Um, but all humans are different. I can tell you that there were people on that rooftop that could see the drone when there's no way I could see it with my 55 year old eyes. You know, that I'm not seeing anything, but they're like, yeah, the drone's right there. It's it's going this direction, that direction. So. There's there's so much um, human interaction. You know, we're all human. You know, we have our cap you know limitations and capabilities. Um, but what's the effectiveness of the human brain to to be a visual observer and really you know truly define what a visual observer is supposed to be? You know, what's the attention span of the human as opposed to a machine, a, a, you know, a radar system, a, a, an optical system, whatever the case may be? And you start seeing fatigue changes it. You know, age changes it. Um, you know, environmental factors change it. So the, the human is probably the least reliable of all types of, of, of visual observation. Um, I know the FAA had to go down that road of using a human VO, you know, to start with, with all of our operations. Um, but, in, and obviously there is a level that it's absolutely necessary and absolutely perfect and, and works very well. But when we start talking BV loss operations, we're starting to get into to how effective really is a human being. And, and the, the reality is, there's there's going to be better technical ways. We got to bring that cost in to where it's it's feasible to do. Um, so we now we can 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 attack the, the cost side as well as the operational side and the return on investment side. Um, but we we need to be there with machines eventually uh, doing this and, and replace the humans when it comes to visual observation. We left out. <laughs> Funny story before we move on to the next panelist. So. My EV thought um, using the vision sensors thought a motorcycle I was passing by was a semi. Okay, um, I could clearly see it was a motorcycle. Um, so, I mean, obviously it was, it's a little bit like, and we were talking about weather in the last session, like just go out, take a look. Like, yeah, you're right. I may not be able to see 10 miles away. Can't verify that, but like, I'm gonna go outside to get hyper local information around everything that I can see within a 50, you know, five, you know, 50 foot window. I'm, I'm gonna use me. I'm gonna trust my ob observation. Now I get your point. Completely get your point. And I'd like to hear another perspective on this. So let's move to John. Yeah. So hopefully human eyeballs aren't needed at all, right? Um, there's a drone 50 miles away that I want to take off and 
inspect something, not, right? Let's not think that it has to fly a long distance. It's really about a long distance from where you are, right? I don't need to roll a truck to some cell tower if I can have a dock, boom, take it off, do inspection. Um, so I, I think it's ideally less about the human eyes and more about, A, what's the uh, risk threshold of the NAS by having a drone climb up and, and do some flight. Um, that's going to vary depending on the operation, but I think let's recognize it's, it's pretty low. Uh, I think the second piece that is most impactful is how cooperative are other aircraft. And I think um, people always make a big deal like, we can't see all the drones, right? Where is everything? And I was talking to someone at the FAA yesterday. I said, let's get helicopters more cooperative. Let's get small airplanes more cooperative, right? Those are big planes, often carrying um, one, if not multiple people, bunch of gasoline on that thing, right? Like that's what we want to be aware of. And I think as drone pilots, if you tell us where you're at, we will do everything you can within our power to stay out, out of your way. So I think it's how do we get a more cooperative airspace? And if you're not going to be cooperative, you kind of fall down the totem pole a little bit in terms of right to that airspace. I uh, appreciate that, John. Um, Reno. I think where we are seeing is where uh, the, the uh, standard definition of the VO to directly monitor the aircraft or help in the navigation of the aircraft. We're seeing uh, under these waivers or type of operations where the VO is stepping out more to uh, uh, help in the situational awareness of the airspace and move towards more of a supervisory oversight capacity. Uh, while there's a lot of level of autonomy in the dock itself, uh, the, the human intervention can still be used as an additional layer of safety, especially for any unforeseen challenges or any complex situations. While the drone may be very quick to react and has a lot of algorithms to uh, create those uh, safety mitigations, um, having that human also make that decision uh, does, uh, does definitely add that additional layer of safety. And, um, you know, if it could be a situation, you know, you detected an aircraft and uh, uh, what are you doing? Is this RTH the best situation? Do we jump in and get in the RC control? Do I look at the computer uh, and control it through the control software? Uh, there's an emergency stop. Do I click that? But will it go back to the set altitude? So there, there are different ways in which I think we're seeing that human intervention or the human layer uh, come into place, uh, uh, not just take on the traditional VO role, but in fact, um, add in an additional layer of safety that can mitigate certain risks that happens with these uh, autonomous flights. Thanks, Reno. Akaki, your thoughts on this one? Yeah, VOs are interesting topic. It's, uh, you know, I feel like uh, what is really good, like we're seeing quite a lot of like BV loss waivers now with the VOs uh, coming out and then it's really encouraging kind of, I feel like, everyone kind of cracked that like uh, formula that uh, how to get a uh, waiver. Uh, what is kind of controversial is that uh, it's kind of a set, set standard that, okay, VO or human can see like two miles, 360 degree around you, which it's even proven in the studies that it's not true, right? Like it's like way less. Not way less, but like less, and then not, you know, humans get tired, you know, like they could be in the sun, you know, this and that. So like basic, basic human factors, right? So uh, yeah, this uh, performance of the VO is kind of another uh, level, right? So I think eventually, uh, I think we all agree that we should move to some kind of like technology solution, right? It could be a uh, you know, radar, acoustic, or view, uh, visual systems, or something else, right? But like, I think you cannot do, you know, 20 mile uh, parcel delivery with the uh, VOs. Uh, but I think uh, there's also a lot of conversations about the roles of the humans uh, on the, let's say, RPIC side, which I think that, and I think eventually, 
we will move into and then we'll see quite a lot of uh, some uh, waivers coming out the uh, m to n basically or one to many uh, waivers uh, meaning one pilot uh, many uh, vehicles and i think that's the correct way of going forward basically rpic becomes more like a manager than a pilot I still believe that we will need this manager for quite some time, uh, even with this past, I guess, year and a half investment advancements in the AI and so on. We've seen that you know sometimes this advanced technologies and autonomy uh, autonomous systems they could get faulty and then get faulty, you know, like they call it hallucination and so on. So. You know, it could get really wrong. So I think we'll still need this human over the loop for quite some time. And then once we have this uh, confidence in the systems, then maybe we could go to this like fully, fully autonomous operations without maybe any human oversight. All right. So you heard it from Akaki. Um, you're not going to be losing your jobs. You're moving to middle management. Um, so. Yeah. Uh, we actually got a question about this. I want to throw it in now because it, it pairs with a, my next question. Um, so what would the, the question from from the audience is what would happen if the U if the FAA adopted Sora instead? So let me reframe just a little bit. Um, I mean, that, that is a very great question. But like if, if we compare our approach to BV loss and drone docs with international practices, other CAAs, what insights can we gain? Like how can cross border learnings accelerate? progress and safety in our operations. Let's uh, let's go backwards. Uh, I'm going to go right back to Akaki. Uh, I think it would be easier for the industry, uh, you know, because like we help customers in Europe, in Canada, in, um, in South America, right? Like, and then people adopted already, you know, SOAR methodology. So we know how to do that. And then we uh, and then even honestly, credit to the FAA, FAA was always saying like, hey, if you want to do a SORA, you know, you can submit your, you know, uh, safety risk assessment with uh, with SORA and then they would translate that internally. They would still uh, would prefer their own uh, uh, process. But I, I think honestly, like this unification and then, you know, everyone to be on the same page throughout the world, especially I think because the industry is becoming more international and global. So it's not that, you know, I'm doing my own stuff, right? Like, so uh, that would, I think it would be easier for people like me <laughs> who deal with the different regulators because like everyone speaks the same language. You know, you can translate, but you know, in a translate translation, there are some issues sometimes, right? So uh, yeah, I, I, I think we could then focus on some other things if we all agree on this. Uh, and then again, Sora is not perfect for every use case, right? Like you go to more complex, very complex things. Yes, you need something else. But hey, like, I don't know, infrastructure inspection in Europe and in the US, are they that different that, you know, we need like two different systems? Yeah, I don't know. So yeah, uh, I'm all for that. <laughs> all right, uh, Reno. Yeah, we're like I said, we're gonna go backwards. Yeah, so uh, while the Sora, I mean, like Kaki said, I mean, uh, it's 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 been widely uh, adopted in uh, EASA. We've seen in Canada, we've seen other uh, regulators looking at it as a foundational risk-based approach uh, for uh, drone risk assessment. Um, I think, uh, and uh, while the FA still accepts it as one of the means to show your risk-based approach. Um, I think it would definitely benefit uh, if the uh, uh, if FAA could streamline to to what these uh, other countries are adopting uh, closer towards the SORA methodology. And uh, if you look at the case of Canada, we, we don't see them uh, completely following the SORA as it is. We do see a Canadian version uh, of the risk assessment, right? I mean, you look at the basic principles of the air risk, the ground risk. Uh, make sure you have operational safety objectives and you meet the level of uh, matrix within that. So uh, I think uh, looking towards that foundational principles, 
uh, of the SORA guidelines uh, for a risk-based approach uh, uh, would be beneficial. Thanks, Renal. John? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, personally, I think there's some issues with SORA. Um, population density is one of my pet peeves because, again, it doesn't really tell you anything, right? Like, there could be 20 thousand million billion people in a building really high population density zero risk right they're in a building to, you know if, if i'm flying a drone near there so um i think some of those things need to be improved upon but um from a higher level you look at um a framework that says let's evaluate risk probability severity right not the absolute worst thing that could possibly happen but What's the realistic aspect of this? And um, you know, some of the ARC stuff I think touched on this as well as you know just likelihood, right? Uh, people are outside seven percent of the day, so uh, automatically the chance that a drone is going to fall out of the sky and hit you in the head goes down quite a bit, right? So we we start to get into pretty you know infinitesimal type numbers when you think about okay what's the likelihood that some BB loss drone is going to kill you? I'm going to say pretty much zero, right? So if we can use something like Sora to address that and it's accepted, I, I think it's, it's a win. And I think most importantly, if we can start to get international congruity around this, the better, because it's, it's uh, you know, it may not affect every operation, but the more that, the rules are the same, the methodologies are the same, it, it just is gonna make implementation of this on a global nature, I think that much more streamlined and, and effective. John, thank you. Uh, Jim, final thought on this question. Well, I, I think a, a unified thought process, you know, um, everywhere a drone would be flown would be an amazing thing, um, obviously, but, you know, from the highest level there, to, to think that regulatory bodies from all over the world could actually agree on something is uh, there, there's a lot more there's, there's political ramifications and, and rabbit holes that we'd go down all day long um you know the sora need, needs work obviously um it would we would love to have a, a base system um but like you know john mentioned you know high de high population density inside of a skyscraper in new york is is one thing whereas a you know rural application in in, in agricultural land and things like that's another but you know it, it, there's it's so complex and so subjective um, it's going to be very difficult. We all have that goal. Um, the, the, the closer we can get, the better it's going to be. Um, but the, 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 the SORA has to be redesigned in a way that it allows for a lot more subjectivity to be applied. All right, lightning round. Because um, we're getting towards the end. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. And I have another panel to go to. Um, what do you want this audience to take away about U.S. drone BV loss operations, specifically for drone docks? So let's go back around the horn. Um, let's go, uh, Rena. It's going to pick a random. Yeah, so, oh, I think we've seen already waivers approved for drones and shielded airspace and uh, shielded operations. And now when you introduce a doc, what you want to make sure is that, uh, what are the additional risks associated with the doc? And you need to prove your safety case with how is that automation charging being done? Those maintenance checks, those payload checks. Uh, you know, the, the typical pre-flight checks that you would do uh, when a human is involved. So um, your duty would be to understand those differences of introducing a dock and the connectivity between the dock and the drone and uh, understanding the risks involved with that autonomy level and uh, prove that you have tactical and strategic mitigations to mitigate those risks involved with an operation involved uh, with the drone and the dock. Thanks, Reno. John. I, I think the more that we can think more about the type of flight that's going to happen more than, um, you know, is it a dock or, or what it is? I think one of the um, views I kind of touched on this earlier of a dock is that um, we can do, you know, short flights, right, within a very small perimeter, but far away from humanity right and that's where you get you know huge huge um benefits and economic value of being able to deploy a drone go take some images capture some footage do an inspection um so i, I think there, there's so much value there there's plenty of other complex 
um, type of dock operations, right? If you're thinking, all right, let me put these around the city. I can have drone as a first responder, right? There's a lot more complexity when it comes to planning, um, safety, and, and where that operates. So I think just recognizing that there's a wide breadth of dock operations, but the the fundamental piece of, of having that drone ready to take off in a bunch of strategic places from uh, for whatever your organization needs is, is so uh, game changing. And I think the, um, you know, what we see with DJI and hopefully this just helps keep pushing the industry further is the technology is getting so good, right? The footprint's getting smaller. You don't need, you know, massive installation to, to uh, get it running. So I, I think um, a lower price point, lower footprint, it's going to make the, I think the incentive and, and really the demand to, Use a dock. It's just gonna uh, okay. Be yeah, thanks, John. Akaki. Like I said, let's keep it thirty seconds. We got to wrap. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think this year is gonna be really interesting and really good overall for the industry. Uh, coming uh, part one hundred eight coming out would be really really good for industry. I guess what we have to set our expectations is that you know this rule won't. Uh, solve all of your problems, you still have to do your homework, you know, like, it's not that all of a sudden we can fly whatever we want, be we lost, like, we still, as an industry, industry, have to do our homework, but I think regular is going, uh, moving towards the uh, right direction, so I'm actually really looking forward to for that. Kaki, Jim, take us out. Um, I think that it's safe to say the technology is here, um, we've got it, it's getting better every day, but we have it, and it's an exciting time. Um, we need to be diligent to, to stay on our regulators, whatever country we're in, to make sure that they understand the technology and move forward with us. And probably the most important piece of this is that we all have to, to be diligent, and when we're using this new technology, use it correctly, use it safely, because it's going to take one small mistake or one, one small incident that's a big mistake to set us all back two years right off the bat. Absolutely. Wow. And look, thank you all so much this has really been a great conversation around the mapping the u.s regulatory landscape um hope everyone in the audience uh just appreciated what what just went down this is so much expertise and and just insights that that were shared so thank you to each one of you panelists for being part of this uh nest gen 24 we're just going to keep going uh we're not done yet we're going to kick it over to the next session on drone autonomy the vision for 2030 so we'll see you over there